How about there is a more uh, controversial argument when you're discussing uh, the purpose of life and the non-belief in an afterlife. It is when people say that if you don't believe in an afterlife and in religious principles, you cannot have moral principles. I know you don't quite accept that. <laughs> no, well. <laughs> right. Um, the idea that the only reason we are moral is that we believe in an afterlife and therefore we are striving to be rewarded with the carrot of heaven or to avoid the stick of hell, um, which is what, in effect, you've just said. What an ignoble reason for being good. What a terribly bad reason. What a terribly immoral reason for being moral. I would... <laughs> I was once on a, a, a radio program in the United States and you had one of these phone-ins, people phone in with their questions. And one man in Texas phoned in and said that if he didn't believe in God, if he, didn't, if he wasn't afraid of going to hell, he would murder his neighbor. <laughs> so I said, you don't really mean that. You don't seriously mean that if it wasn't for the fear of God, you would go out and murder your neighbor. And he said, absolutely I would. He said, I would go out and rape the next woman I saw. Um, I cannot seriously believe that there are many people who are only held back from uh, doing bad things by the fear of God. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, one of my colleagues who's written a, another book um, written much the, much the same time called God is Not Great, um, he puts it like this. The Bible says thou shalt not kill in the Ten Commandments. And he sarcastically remarks, do you really mean to say that when Moses came down from the mountain with the, with the tablets that said, thou shalt not kill, people said, oh, thou shalt not kill. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, all right, we thought it was rather a good idea to kill. <laughs> the, the other, uh, yes, okay, I think I said that. <laughs> In, the, in another book of yours, uh, The Devil's Chaplain, uh, also published in Brazil a few years ago, and by the way, you're not the devil's chaplain, you make clear in the book, you write a letter to your daughter, who was then 10 years old, and you warn her against uh, the influence of tradition, authority, and revelation. Please yes, let us know about yes. that. Um, you're, you're right. My book, A Devil's Chaplain, uh, is, is a reference to Darwin, who said, when he was talking about the, the cruelty of nature, and natural selection is cruel, uh, he said, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the low, blundering, cruel, horribly wasteful, I didn't get the words exactly right, ways of nature. So my book is called A Devil's Chaplain, but I don't want to be the, the devil's chaplain. The last chapter of the book, it's a, it's a collection of essays, mostly published before. Uh, the last essay in the book is this letter to my then 10-year-old daughter, Juliet. Uh, when I wrote the book, the collected essays, I presented it to her. She was the dedicatee on her 18th birthday. In that chapter, in that letter, open letter to her at the age of 10, I didn't specifically tell her to be an atheist. I would never do that. Children should not be indoctrinated. I did ask her to think for herself. I did try to explain, I think the opening lines of the chapter are, how do we know the things that we know? And I gave the answer, evidence. And I explained a bit from a scientific point of view what evidence is. And then I warned her against various bad reasons that people sometimes give for thinking that they know something. And these were revelation, tradition, and authority. Uh, I said, those are not good reasons to believe anything. The only good reason to believe something is evidence. Uh, and um, I'm, I would like that book, that, that chapter to be read by any 10-year-old child. I am very, very keen not to indoctrinate children with atheism any, any more than they should be indoctrinated with, with religion. I think one of the most wicked things you can do to a child is to tell the child, you are a Christian child, you are a Muslim child, you are a Catholic child, or you are a Presbyterian child, whatever it might be. 
The child is too young to know. A child is too young to be a Catholic or a Muslim or a Protestant. Let the child grow up and decide for herself whether she wants to believe those things. If ever you hear somebody saying, that is a Catholic child, or that is a Protestant child, or that is a Muslim child, you should wince. It's consciousness raising in the same kind of way as the feminists raised our consciousness. I don't know how it works in Portuguese, but in, in um, the English-speaking world, feminists have taught us remarkably successfully not to use the word man when we mean human, not to use the word he when we might mean she. It's very difficult to do in English, and it's probably even harder to do in, 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 gender, in more gendered languages. But the feminists have succeeded in raising our consciousness so that whenever we hear the future of man, we kind of wince, we kind of draw back and think, that, that's wrong, you shouldn't say that. And in exactly the same way, I would like everyone here to wince when they hear somebody talking about a Catholic child. There is no such thing as a Catholic child. There is a child of Catholic parents. Uh, well, <laughs> touch upon an, uh, another area of your uh, work that some people might not be familiar with. Uh, perhaps you can tell us about the importance of in the context of science, the importance of poetry and literature. I love poetry. I love language. Uh, I read poetry. I know a lot of poetry by heart. I don't really understand, although I love it, I don't quite understand what poetry is. I don't understand why it works. Um, I'm haunted by it, it gives me goose pimples, it make, gives me shivers up the spine, but I still don't really quite um, understand it. I do think, and I've written a book about this called Unweaving the Rainbow, um, to, perhaps the translator knows how that, the, um, that's actually translated into Portuguese. Um, it may not be exactly the same. I'm sure that, um, uh, that the word rainbow comes into it somewhere. That book, Unweaving the Rainbow, is my attempt to um, unite poetry and science and to advocate science as a worthy, more than worthy uh, subject for poets, one that I feel poets have neglected. Uh, of course, love is a great theme for poetry, and even religion is a great theme for poetry, but science might be an even greater one, and one that hasn't been really exploited by, by poets.